Hi, this is your host, Sapnil Bhartia, and welcome to another special episode of TFLS Talk here at KubeCon EU in Amsterdam, Netherlands. And today we have with us once again, Matt Butcher, CEO of Fermion. Matt, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me again. And the great thing is that we are doing it in person. We have done so much remotely. It's excellent. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, meeting, you know, face-to-face has yeah. a totally different experience, totally different chemistry. Yeah. Which brings me to the point of, you know, KubeCon in person. You know, we are returning and this time no masks. So it yeah. kind of gives a feel of pre-COVID era again. Yeah. Audience, I remember, I think the KubeCon China was the biggest audience. And I, we are seeing the same kind of audience here now. Yeah. So talk a bit about, first of all, you know, when you walk around or people walk to your booth or you mm-hmm. go out on shows or you talk to your peers, what kind of discussions you're seeing around WebAssembly? Yeah, well, we had the WebAssembly pre-day happen on Tuesday. And uh, that... To me, that's pretty much the high point of my year. We've got one in North America, we've got one here. And uh, you you get a lot of the people who are in this cloud native ecosystem. We've all been working on Kubernetes and Helm and and container technologies and Docker for a while. So we've got this common background. And now we're looking at WebAssembly, you know, this promising technology that I think is making some big inroads in the cloud. So, you know, we kicked it off with the WASM day on Tuesday. Uh, At that conference, you know, Topics range from things like, here's where the standards are right now, to, hey, check out some really new and exciting applications of this technology. So it was really kind of a good, uh, uh, you know, rush of endorphins to kind of get the the big story about WebAssembly right now. And then from there, you know, we've gone into KubeCon and had these great conversations. I feel like in 2022, a lot of the big questions were like, is this WebAssembly thing really gonna be a thing outside of the browser? And now, you know, this year, we've really seen that transition to people saying, we are excited. We understand the potential and the possibilities of this, and let's see what we can build. Excellent. And when you meet people, do you hear questions, hey, what is WebAssembly? Yeah, I mean, it's still early enough that we've got, you know, we've got it. It's a started in 2015, so it's you know come on, it's an eight year old technology at this point. Uh, so there are some people who have been doing this for a long time, but you know like with Ruby, where Ruby was around for about ten years before Rails, and many of us, even even those of us who knew lots of different programming languages, Ruby wasn't even on our radar, and then suddenly a new thing pops up, and and Ruby goes from relative obscurity to the to the mainstream. I think WebAssembly is kind of having that moment right now. And so you've got some people who have been doing it since 2015 and they're seasoned experts. And you've got others of us who came along, you know, a few years ago. And then the the vast majority of people, I think, are just kind of learning about it for the first time now. So if I ask you, when people ask, what is WebAssembly, how do you define it to them? I mean, I like to define it by saying what it was originally designed to solve and then why that is exciting to apply different places. You know, it was originally a a browser-oriented technology. And... I mean, I kind of grew up with the web browser, right? Uh, The first couple of languages I learned were Java and JavaScript. uh, Back when Java was going to be the browser programming language and JavaScript was a toy language that you would use to wire the Java to the the browser. That story didn't work out the way that everybody thought it was, right? JavaScript, the toy language, suddenly matured. Well, it didn't suddenly. Over time, it gradually matured into a more and more robust language, a more and more robust ecosystem. Java in the browser was never quite performant enough to kind of capture the large market. But over time, we tried all these different ways to add other languages to the web browser, right? There was ActiveX and Silverlight and Flash. Each of them kind of suffered from a couple of different limitations. One of them is they were all proprietary technologies, which meant we were usually dealing with just one single vendor. And the other one was, they were coupled with a specific programming language that was, for the most part, in most of these cases, very, very specific to the browser. So WebAssembly was really started to address that problem, to those two problems, and try again. So it was done as an open standard in W3C along with HTML and CSS, but also it was done by a con- consortium of developers who said, and this is from you know, Apple, Mozilla who started it, uh, Microsoft's IE, at the time, IE team, and, and the Chrome team at Google, they got together and worked on this together and they said, we'll just define a binary format to run in the browser and then we can compile different languages to it. So instead of introducing a new programming language, 
we'll just introduce a new binary format and then tool all the compilers to compile to that. And then, you know, the first language they wanted to do, and I think this is a great choice, the first language they wanted to do was C, because we have this huge legacy of C code stretching back decades and decades. Uh, what is interesting about that is that while, while the browser never really took off, I mean, we did see some big use cases for it in the browser. Figma uses it, it compiles their C++ into WebAssembly. Adobe uses it. Uh, but those are, it's not the kind of thing where, you, you know, your everyday uh, uh, front-end developer, everyday web developer is like, I spend 99% of my day writing code to compile to WebAssembly, right? It's still fairly niche there. Uh, but the, the characteristics that made it interesting for the web browser, uh, they're, frankly, they're applicable in all kinds of other places. So when you think about what it means to run somebody else's code in your web browser, right? First thing you, got, you, you think is, okay, I don't want somebody's C code to mess around with my system. So it's got to have a really good security sandbox. And in fact, the WebAssembly security sandbox is even uh, more constrained than the JavaScript security sandbox because you don't even want it to be able to do nefarious things to your, to your JavaScript because you might be exporting somebody or importing somebody else's WebAssembly module into your code. So the security model is really good. Uh, and then on top of that, it has to be highly portable because long gone, thankfully, are the days where you say, oh, this, this site only runs on IE on Windows or and this, and, and this one only runs on an, on an Intel machine and not an ARM machine or something like that. So it had to be very portable. And then it had to be really fast, right? Because when, uh, when we work in our browser, we expect things to be very snappy, right? We have an incredibly low tolerance for latency in the browser. Uh, which is funny because when it started, it was the slowest thing ever. And, but now at this point, our expectation is it's going to download quickly. It's going to execute quickly. So, and that, that really, that's kind of the story that gets me into why I found it interesting. I had no interest in the web browser case. Um, my team, we were working on cloud technologies and we, we were in the Kubernetes ecosystem and working on containers. And we started taking a look at serverless computing um, and, and we, took a look at it in the sense of how is this actually running inside the cloud and is it efficient and is it fast and can we make it faster and more efficient? That was kind of the original prompt that got us uh, talking about what cloud architecture looks like. So if you were to go down and, and you know, walk the show floor at KubeCon today, uh, you would see, you know, there are really two kinds of cloud compute that have gotten the vast majority of interest from people. There's virtual machines on the one hand, you know, going from VMware and EC2 at AWS, you know, you've got this kind of uh, workhorse of the cloud, right? This big, beefy, very secure, very robust cloud compute engine. And the size of the images you're dealing with are gigs and gigs, right? And the startup time for a virtual machine, it's minutes. But once you got that thing going, you've got a full operating system from the kernel all the way up to your application level. So that's the first category, right? Then the disruptive technology several years ago is containers, right? There's so much lighter weight. You just put your application in there in your file system and add any of the system libraries you need and, uh, and, and package it up in a Docker image and, and deploy it. And then with Kubernetes, we got this huge orchestration system. So, we're looking at this situation going, all right, so you got a big heavyweight one, then you've got kind of this middleweight class, and we're looking at the rise of serverless, and we're going, the serverless model is supposed to work like this. A request comes in, and your serverless function starts up, executes just that one request, returns a response, and shuts down, right? So ideally, we're starting up in milliseconds, executing this thing and shutting down right away. So we want the leanest possible runtime for this kind of workload. But it also has to have that same security model that containers and virtual machines have because you want to run untrusted code, right? You want people to be able to upload whatever code they want and they'll, you know, in the, in the Amazon Lambda case, right? We pay them to execute code, but we don't have the expect that they're going to inspect the code and say, yeah, we're not, you know, it's, it's just the security sandbox model makes that safe. So we were looking for something like that. And those same three things that I listed about WebAssembly were the three things that we were that were on our checklist, right? It has to be secure. It has to have an amazing security sandbox. It has to be very, very fast to execute. And it needs to be cross-platform and cross-architecture. Uh, and, and that uh, last use case came from, in part, uh, this desire to, to take advantage of whatever the fastest processor at the time was, or whatever the cheapest, cheapest processor was at the time. And with ARM sort of making this 
huge uh, uh, surge into the cloud computing space. We're going, we don't want a developer who's building on Intel to not be able to take advantage of it. In fact, they shouldn't even know what the system architecture or what the operating system is for this kind of serverless functions world to work. So as we kind of poked around with this to do, with this checklist of features we wanted and we landed on WebAssembly, our first response was, wait, we're seriously talking about taking a browser technology and moving into the cloud, right? Uh, but yeah, yeah, we are. And, and so we started experimenting with it. Turns out that uh, there are standalone WebAssembly interpreters that are actually, oh, I think, close to 20 at this point that don't run in a browser. They run outside the browser. And we began at Fermion starting to build tooling around that. Uh, and the, you know, the first thing we built was Spin, this open source developer toolkit, where we could say, uh, as a developer, I want to be able to go from you know our core user story. As a developer, I want to go from a blinking cursor to a deployed serverless app in 66 seconds, right? And and so that was the that was our goal, and we began building this open source tool to do so. Today's world, of course, I use a lot of desktop applications, but. Most of the applications don't run on our system. They run, you know, on someone. Yeah. So browser has become, you know, kind of gateway. Of course, on apps also, you know. So so you are running somewhere. So but when we look at WebAssembly, is there scope just within the browser, or there is a you know a word outside the browser also for it? Yeah, and that's where I think we have really started to see the momentum here, right? That that those key things, right? The portability, security. There are so many different places in the ecosystem where we need those same features. Um, a good example, I mean, cloud's my passion, right? But there's other good examples of this are IoT, right? Where, uh, you know, uh, Netflix and, uh, uh, sorry, BBC and uh, Disney Plus and Amazon Prime, they all use WebAssembly in their uh, in their players. So if you got a, a Roku or an Apple TV or, or just a smart TV at this point, right? Uh, you load that app and you're running it. Those are WebAssembly. Why are they WebAssembly? Well, because when you have 9,000 different TVs and, and streaming sticks and all of that kind of thing, you don't want to rewrite the same software for each of them. But in the IoT space, uh, you have very specialized hardware, right? We're not talking like off-the-shelf stuff. Or, well, we were talking about an assembly of a lot of different components often, which are unique to, you know, say, LG on this side and, you know, the Roku streaming stick on the other side. And so there's a big advantage in having that kind of cross-platform, cross-architecture story. Security sandbox is, of course, always a compelling feature of any offering, and that kind of fast startup and runtime is, is valuable there. So IoT is one of those places where we started to see WebAssembly take, take a, a hold. Um, I think another one that's been really interesting is taking the WebAssembly runtime itself and starting to embed it in other locations. So my favorite example of this right now is, uh, you know, Single Store, the database company, said, you know, it's inefficient to do a select statement, pull the data out of the database, do a transformation in your program, and push it back in, right? You have to move the data out, page through the data, put it back in, you know, and, and, and there's a little there's there's a little window of uncertainty there when you're pushing and pulling the data that maybe something else could happen. And they said, you know, for the longest time, we have used, uh, you know, PL SQL and other methods of running in database functions, but they've always been sort of expressed in uh, a very specific SQL-like language. What if instead of requiring the developer to learn a language like that, we put WebAssembly inside the database so that the data is transformed at the source of the data instead of pulling the data out and transforming it and putting it back in. So I was really excited to see somebody do that because this is a really novel take on, on, on how to make a database more robust. And the security model, again, is a big deal because normally you'd have to add something low level into the database to do that. And then you're, you're trusting other people's code to be able to do. In this case, you can run it in the database in an interpreter and have it, you know, have that security sandbox while still the full expressiveness of whatever language you choose, whether it's Python on one side or Rust or C or, or uh, JavaScript or whatever. Um, and then, then, yeah, getting back to my favorite topic, right? <laughs> I think the cloud is one of those areas where we'll see a number of applications of WebAssembly because the profile of it just really fits that cloud case where you want something that you can execute quickly and something that you can run to completion. 
And since you brought the point of, you know, these use cases, uh, Linux kernel, when Linux t created that, he had a very specific use case, but look at the use cases beyond the, their own imagination where kernel is being used or Kubernetes, yeah. you know. So sometimes when you yeah. create technologies, users come and, you know, they kind of surprise you that by using it in, in, in situations <laughs> where you're like, what? I love the way you phrase that. That is the truest statement about technology. We yeah. write something going, I'm going to express my inner idea to solve my problem. And you put it out there. And especially in the open source world, yeah. people do things and you're going, I never thought of that. Exactly. And, and sometimes, you know, those moments are like, well, yeah, okay, my, my tool works for a use case I didn't think. And other times you have those moments where, you're, where you say, oh, I didn't realize that if I make a little change over here and change the direction of my, from my original idea to this direction, it's you know, huge. Um, and I love that. I think it's one of the coolest things about open source that we basically empower our community as a whole to, to be part of that process. But I love it as a, the, the kind of creative part of me, like seeing people interact with it and do things that I never anticipated and then watch things adjust. Uh, that was one of my favorite things when we started. Uh, I started, I was one of the people who started the Helm project. And if you rewind in the Helm code base back to the early days, you just kind of roll your eyes and go, Matt, Matt, what were you thinking, <laughs> right? right? Because it was, we had a very specific use case. And then people were saying, oh, well, could we do this? Could we do this? Could this be a generic package manager for Kubernetes? And we just, you know, you start by making a couple small adjustments and a big one and then a couple more small ones. And it has just been such a such an enjoyable journey to watch a technology evolve. And WebAssembly is right you know, like Helm was, you know, rewind it five or six years and like Kubernetes was rewinding back that the WebAssembly ecosystem is just now hitting that point where we're saying, oh, this this was started as a special case technology and look at all the different things that we could do with it that really play to its strengths. And then how do we take that and start building the the, the things that we're envisioning now? Right. No, very well said. And I also want to talk a bit about, uh, because you also talked about the serverless, you know, point earlier. So I think yeah. that is already covered. I do want to talk about Fermion a bit, you know, as you see the the ecosystem around WebAssembly is kind of evolving, you know, yeah. beyond yeah. your own imagination. So what does it mean for Fermion and uh, how is company uh, evolving with this evolving yeah. ecosystem? Yeah, and we really wanted to at Fermion. Uh, show people the power of WebAssembly again, you know, in in the serverless world specifically, but really show people that that uh, you can build applications in a very fast and efficient way, and uh, and then execute them on the cloud in a very fast and efficient way. So when we got started, uh, the first thing we wanted to do was build an open source developer oriented tool, uh, and this is called Spin, and build this tool specifically to kind of uh, help the developer get started right away. And so there are kind of there are kind of four steps to this, right? The first step is when I really am getting started, I, I start with an empty a, a, an empty space, right? A blank space, a blank canvas, uh, and I got to get from that to something. So we've created the spin new command that basically will scaffold out an application in the language of your choice. So I'm like spin new, you know, HTTP REST to start an HTTP REST project, and then give it a name, hello world, or whatever. And then that dumps a scaffold of the code in there that's you know, 12 lines of code long, but it's 12 more lines you don't have to write, and then sets up your compiler and everything, because that's kind of the trick of any of these things, is getting all the little uh, build details right. So spin new does that. Then you code a little bit, you want to compile it, you type in spin build, it drops down to your compiler, compiles the code into a WebAssembly module, and then you can type in spin up and have it start up a local instance that you can test out. So we wanted that, what we call the developer inner loop, right? That part where you're looking at the screen with your hands on the keyboard, typing away, trying to get your idea into the code, right? And that, that spin new, spin build, spin up is, is there to help you get that kind of thing done. And then when you're ready to push it out, there's a spin deploy command. And uh, by default, it'll go out to Fermion Cloud, which is our hosted platform. Uh, it's free right now. Uh, at, at, some, at some point, we'll need to pay our own paychecks, so we will have to charge for the like higher level tiers. But uh, we wanted to build something where people could host their blogs and build their applications, and that would always be free. And then when you get into a you know enterprise use case or something like that, then then we would charge for that kind of thing. But if if Trying Fermion Cloud is not your thing, right? We also released an open source version of the whole uh, Fermion platform that you can install into your cloud account or on bare metal. You can put it on anything from like, you know, DigitalOcean, AWS, uh, uh, Google, Amazon, uh, Azure, kind of whatever, whatever your preferred cloud or, or metal is. 
And then you can have your own instance there, which of course you get to manage, <laughs> but you know, it's a nice, easy way to do it. And then, uh, you know, Docker integrated it recently into their desktop. So if you're, you're a big Docker fan, download the new preview of Docker desktop and you can try it out locally there. Uh, and then we're starting to see, and this is particularly uh, relevant for KubeCon, right? We're starting to see people roll this into Kubernetes as well. So, uh, so Azure is, is previewing a version of Spin inside of AKS so that you can write a Kubernetes manifest to deploy your WebAssembly application into a Kubernetes cluster. And they contributed all that work upstream into the ContainerD project, which is a core piece of the kind of cloud native ecosystem. And, that, and in fact, that's the project that Docker uses as well to provide Docker desktop support. So it's really cool right now uh, to be seeing the momentum build for being able to execute these things. And, and now, you know, with Spin making it easy to develop it and uh, develop WebAssembly based applications and then all these different runtimes that people can choose from, uh, at least in, in this case, it's a very simple process. Now, if you're doing IoT, there's still a lot of work you'll have to do, but in this cloud world, I think we're seeing a lot of momentum gather. And I think what we have shown is that WebAssembly is not just a viable thing to run in the cloud, but a really exciting thing that's gonna solve some problems. Matt, thank you so much for sitting down with me. I wish there was more time so that we can you know, talk in you know, depth more about other things. Uh, I wanted to go deeper into more use cases and everything. So let's do it uh, you know, once again, either remotely or if we see each other at any other open source event. But I really appreciate your time with it. Thank you. Yeah, so glad we could sit down together in person. It's been fabulous.